And it's that time of the day when we take you around the world of business on Business Incorporated. 55 minutes, that's what we'll be doing. And here's what we have for you on the program. Nigeria and Germany are partnering on skills development and exports. And Zambia begins copper trade implemented by the government. We'll take a look at Egypt's forex reserve. Good afternoon. Welcome to the program. I'm Ini John McQuarrie. We'll start from Nigeria. It's unusual, right? But the Executive Director of uh, Export Promotion, Director of uh, Promotion Council, uh, Mrs. Noye Ayeni, has been speaking on her plans to grow the nation's non-oil export. She was uh, talking during an interview with reporters and explained that value addition for all export products will form part of the council's strategies to achieve it's double your export initiative. What we did in the council in recent times is to identify the top 20 products based on the level of production in the country and the level of demand in the global market. So we picked the three, the 20 top products and we want to give it intensity and attention from the farm gate to the market assets. So we, based on that, we have the early team. We believe that with this, we should also be able to achieve the our mantra of W export within the within 12 months to 18 months. Again, uh, we also are working with various exporters, encouraging them to also find ways of uh, adding value to their products as value addition. Because at this point in the history of our country, again, we can no longer export commodities just raw because you just earn normal price in the global market. So we're encouraging the exporters to ensure that they add value because pro processed commodities give you premium price in the market, in the global market. Some of the exporters already have the processing facilities and we're going to support them, working with them to ensure that through that, we will be able to increase the volume and value of our export. And a nine-man delegation from the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development is in Nigeria, and they're here to continue conversations with the Federal Ministry of Finance, Federal Ministry of Communications, Innovation and Digital Economy, the Federal Ministry of Budget and Economic Planning, and the Federal Ministry of Arts, Culture and Creative Economy. Uh, issues will be bordering on skills acquisition, development, and exports between both countries. The delegation is led by the German Minister of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's a meeting holding at the request of the German Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, led by the Minister, Venger Scholz. And also Mr. Chazo, the Director General Small Medium Enterprise Development Agency of Nigeria. The Minister comes with a proposal of cooperation between Nigeria and Germany on issues ranging from development of women-led MSMEs, skills development, and talent exports between both countries. Our cooperation, I want to point out that is again, is in our common interest. Nigeria is Africa's largest and most populous economy, and Germany is an export na nation. We are interested in growing markets. So some 90 German companies are already active here in Nigeria, and uh, one reason is that Nigeria has so many creative young people, and that is what companies like to, to have and why they are here. Her proposals are attractive to the Nigerian government. Vice Chancellor Herbeck, and he recommended that we meet with you on specific asks that we had asked. One was on the development of the SME subsector in Nigeria, and the other one was in building skills and certification of um, artisans whereby we knew that um, Germany was interested in a vocational skill worker exchange partnership. And I'd like to inform you that we've been in touch with AHK and we are in the process of signing an MOU for that to happen. And that will streamline the talent acquisition uh, program and the talent exchange program as we've spoken. This meeting is a follow-up to earlier deliberations on the sidelines of the G20 Investment Summit. 
Uh, so now let's uh, head a bit to the global space. Oil prices were a little moved in early trading on Tuesday as market participants assessed a visit to the Middle East by the United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to discuss a ceasefire offer in the region. Blinken met with Saudi Arabia's de facto ruler Monday, set to meet with the Egypt uh, leadership today. Let's look at the numbers. Uh, we see that uh, for Brent, it's up 0.15% at $78.10. Still losing that $80 mark uh, that uh, it has got used to for a bit. WTI from the United States, $72.86 a barrel. And that's also up 0.12. Now, the ceasefire offer delivered by... Uh, 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 Hamas last week by Qatari and Egypt mediators. They're still awaiting reply uh, from that Brent crude. Also, we saw the United States continues its campaign, you know, against Iran backed with this in Yemen, whose attacks on shipping vessels have disrupted global oil trading routes. And still uh, staying in the global space now, we look at what's happening with uh, the grains uh, right there. We have the numbers to see what's happening with wheat. And uh, soy bean uh, doesn't look like we have those numbers. So we just move back here in Nigeria uh, with wheat and kernel state. Uh, you, you must have heard, it seems protests are erupting in a whole lot. Oh, there we have the numbers right there for uh, the grain. So we see wheat is up 0.5%. Wheat is very important. It's going to be an important conversation on the program today. So pay attention to that. It's up 0.5% at $5.93 for a bushel. Can we have the other grains? Soybeans is down on the flip side uh, at $11.95. It dropped slightly, 0.1%. Uh, corn is up at 0.2%. It added for half a bushel, it costs $4.43. I think we have soybeans to close that up uh, for now. Okay, we don't have that, so... I'll just, I'll be satisfied with what I have. But I was talking about wheat and, you know, it's an important material, a raw material for a lot of staple foods, bread, top of it. And so I guess we shouldn't be surprised when we hear there's a wheat protest, you know, in Nigeria. The only question would be, why did we choose wheat when we have, you know, some other uh, alternative that could have been used? But we'll tell you the story that in the commercial city of Kano in northern Nigeria, some women who specialize in baking guraso, gurasa, a local government, a local bread originating from the region, have lamented the high cost of wheat flour in the state. The women uh, who staged the protest said they could not afford to continue production if the prices remained high and the fall in the value of the Naira, removal of fuel subsidy, of course, are factors that are affecting the price of food items, not just wheat or bread. I mean, <laughs> we've had all those conversations here on the program and our business shows on channels, television. In the last six months, the cost of food items have shut up astronomically at all times higher. Bag of wheat, which was sold for 23,000 naira, is now about 42,000 naira. Um, a basket of tomatoes, uh, pepper. Uh, I guess we all live with it. We don't need to be told so much about that. Well, I hope we will not say this is a season of protest in Nigeria because I don't know if we can handle that, the chaos that goes with it. Yesterday was Niger State. Uh, this was even before then, uh, the Kano women protesting uh, the price of wheat right there. So let's delve into the conversation with wheat now uh, and see if there's anything that can be done or if there are alternatives that could be offered. And joining me for this conversation is Miriam Ode. She's an analyst with Financial Derivatives Company. Hi, Miriam. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ini. Thank you for having me. Good to have you. So obviously, wheat is very important. And we saw there the women in Kano protesting. Uh, well, they, they don't do bread, but they have their own local, which they use wheat for. But one would have thought that the uh, baking of gurasa that's the name of the look. I do. Have, you, have you tasted that before? I haven't. Have you done that before? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Okay. <laughs> All right. But, you know, um, now they're protesting wheat. And we know what's happening in the global space, especially since Russia took that fight to the home front of uh, Ukraine. And even though we've seen cheap Russian wheat 
But uh, I mean, bringing it down here, logistics and supply, the Black Sea, the Red Sea, every, all the seas are being affected at this time. I guess we shouldn't be uh, surprised, but it to be, why can't we just use our locals? Why do we need to use imported raw materials? Can't we feed ourselves? Um, and it, that's a very good question, but the problem is the supply production. Nigeria's wheat production is actually suboptimal and is not enough to meet the domestic needs. And this is why the country needs to import wheat from um, the global market. And we're seeing that despite the fact that global wheat prices are falling, the domestic price of wheat flour is increasing as it increased by 70% to 50, about 50,000 naira for a bag. And meanwhile, the price of wheat in the global market has declined by 21%. And the main reason why we're not seeing this um, decline in wheat prices reflects in wheat flour, the domestic price of wheat flour, is simply because of the substantial exchange rate depreciation during this period. Now, we all know that um, between February 2023 to February 2024, the Naira has actually fallen by 48% to 1,460 um, Naira to a dollar. That's as of yesterday. And this is even worse at the official market because the Naira has lost about 67% to close at 1,420 Naira to a dollar. So these are the factors. This factor is actually significantly affecting Nigerians domestically. Like we saw the Kano women, they are protesting because the cost of production is high. This is not only for their local um, commodity, but also for like commodities like bread, pasta, um, noodles. And if we even look at it, the price of a carton of spaghetti has increased by, um, has increased to 14,500 to, um, from 8,500. And if we look at the retail price, that is about from 4, 40, um, 450 to 750. That's for one pack is the, um, out of the carton. So Nigerians are actually suffering the brunt of this exchange rate depreciation because we are actually expected to be seeing lower prices for wheat flour and wheat derivatives. That's um, bread, um, spaghetti, pasta, noodles, and all of that, but we are not because of the significant depreciation in the Naira. When we see protests, for instance, uh, the one we had yesterday in Niger State, uh, the protests by mostly women again, since women are, are leading the front of protests at this time, they're feeling it, they can't feed their children, uh, finding it difficult to uh, give them whole meal, uh, and so you see women and, and the young people, you know, taking to the street, which is, is a very dangerous, dangerous uh, 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 sight because we do not know uh, how to control things like this. Uh, so when we have this in Niger State, then we have the women in Kano State. Uh, it, it, can, it presents a, it kind of a difficult situation for the government, don't you think? And now... We have the minimum wage request and the committee sitting, and then uh, the unions are asking for about 400,000 naira. Of course, there's the fear of inflation on one side, and there's also the issue that even when you have this much money, if the value of the naira keeps dropping and prices keep skyrocketing, then we might just be increasing inflation for nothing. Exactly, Ini, you are right. Because um, what's it called? The infra the minimum wage, even if it increases, um, it can fuel inflationary pressures, like you said. And there's also this, I'm sure we've all heard this common um definition of inflation, which is too much money chasing fewer goods. And this is a demand, this is a type of inflation called demand pool inflation. And in a, in order to curb this sort of inflation, the government will either need to um increase the supply of wheat or wheat products in this example, or reduce the demand or both. So what we're going to see is that if the government actually um, agrees to this um, increase in minimum wage to 400,000 naira, that means that disposable income of most consumers or most Nigerians would increase. And what this means is that they would have more, they, they, their marginal propensity to consume or to spend would increase and aggregate demand will increase as a whole. But what about the supply? the supply of which is not going to be increasing proportionally to the increase in the demand for the commodity. And this is going to fuel further inflationary pressures. So as a consumer myself, I am um, the increase in in minimum wage is highly welcomed, but I feel like there needs to be adequate efforts 
or attention to increase the supply of this product so that inflation does not um, double. Because remember that even money supply, money supply has grown by 39% year on year. So if we now fuel it more with this increase in minimum wage, it could worsen inflationary pressures in the country. So um, adequate, basically adequate um, intervention or efforts need to be put in increasing the production and supply of wheat domestically. And I know that the government has already started this initiative because last year, that's November 2023, the government um, offered 50% um, uh, subsidy for import um, for import um, materials used in producing wheat to about 250,000 farmers. So ne we need more of these um, interventions to be able to increase the supply of wheat and um, reduce inflationary pressures in the country in, in the event that possibly the minimum wage is increased. All right, but uh, how do we now talk about, when well, you're talking about the supply, increasing the supply now, how do you see that being ramped up in, in a short term? Um, I feel like to ramp up the um, level of uh, production of wheat in Nigeria, more attention needs to be paid to um, curbing insecurity problems because most of the wheat produced in Nigeria is actually from the north. And Plateau State, for example, is going and, and is suffering a lot of insecurity and has high level of insecurity in the region. So the government needs to actually, the first step would be to curb or reduce or mitigate the level of um, in insecurity or insurgency in this region so that farmers would be able to even access their farms. And from there, we can now even start talking about, okay, import costs, reducing the cost of um, their inputs and um, reducing the cost of their inputs, high fertil um, increasing the availability of fertilizers for the farmers, all that kind of things. So for now, I feel like the first step the government needs to take is to reduce the level of insecurity in, in the north. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Miriam Ode, analyst for Financial Derivatives Company, for sharing your thoughts with us this afternoon. Thank you, Annie, for having me. Let's take a break. When we come back, we'll head to the market. We'll still have uh, Europe uh, correspondents uh, also standing right by and some African stories. Not very good news from South Africa. We'll give you the details in a moment. Do stay with us. <music> Welcome back to Watching Business Incorporated right here on Channels Television. And we're talking about the costs of uh, living, you know, the cost of food and all of that. Well, I guess we would say the government is aware of this. Uh, at least we had this uh, journalist had this conversation with the Minister of Finance, Coordinating Minister of the Economy, Mr. Waledun, yesterday. And he posed a question to him, and it does sound like the government knows what's going on. We're just waiting to see what they will do about it. I think the issue of rising prices is of concern to uh, um, the government and everybody in Nigeria. And then the, some of the major steps which I can point out that are being taken to address this issue, because it's an issue of demand and supply. And a lot of emphasis has been placed on increasing agricultural production in particular. Um, uh, the president has intervened in that sector to provide grains, to provide fertilizer to farmers, to bring additional acreage, rice, wheat, maize, wheat, and cassava um, under additional acreage, additional production in order to increase uh, uh, the output and thereby bring down prices and that will help bring down inflation. And of course, we're in the middle of the dry season farming. We're looking forward to a good dry season harvest that will help to ameliorate food prices in particular and the price level in Nigeria in general. So there you have it, a lot of plans and uh, strategies by the government. Uh, fixing agricultural production obviously should be very top on the list. And uh, keep our fingers crossed and hope that we'll see those products very soon. Or maybe Will has seen it before me, Will. Perhaps that was, that was the minister. I mean, you, you, we've seen protests. We've seen the women protest. Mostly women, because even Most, the group in, in Niger State. The, the yeah. young people. You and find the youth women. there, because yeah. women are the ones who you mentioned earlier. They're the ones who bear the brunt. They take care of the household. Yes. They know where it pinches, because they have to manage The children the come back home, and mm -hmm. you can't give them a good diet. It's the woman's heart that, first of all, sees that heartbreak 
heartbreaking scenario, the cries of a child, you know, and it's really so I heartbreaking. Guess... I'm moved right now because oh, I please know. Don't shed tears. Oh, please don't I'm trying. We're not on to. television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to. When you did, yeah, I, I, on Saturday on Capital Market last Saturday, we were discussing with the MD of NESD, and they were talking about you know, investments where people can invest, and then it, the MD of NESD talked about where's this disposable income. I think Ladi made that comment that right now people are mentioned that the cost of living crisis, where will people find the and they have disposable eaten, yeah. income to even invest? Because they're thinking of food to eat. They even barely have anything to even take care of. So where is the money? Where's the mindset to even think of putting maybe the 5,000 they have left to put in the equities market? I don't think they really <laughs> And have wait. That. And wait, and for, wait it. for it to <laughs> grow. <laughs> for it to grow. When you're hungry. <laughs> wow. So it's really difficult to actually it get is. people to invest. Yeah, but, but, but you know, Will, Nigeria is a very interesting country sure. because in spite of this, in spite of people crying about, you know, money for food, <laughs> daily food, we see the market is booming. Truly. <laughs> that, that's, that, that, that's what I was going to say, that the market is more like, I said yesterday, it's kind of blind. I wonder what is this, like, did it blind so who are those? So who are those investing in the market? Because these are domestic investors, not foreign investors. True. Who are those and who are those who are hungry on the streets? What group do you belong to? Oh, yeah. I will do the data analysis. Put you data on analysis. the spot right yeah. there. <laughs> so we're just going to kick off with markets from Africa where major equities are mostly negative at intraday. We see Nigeria's NGX Dow at intraday 0.18%. That profit taking is persisting there from yesterday, which kicked off the week on a negative note. We've seen South Africa, however, on the flip side, Rising 0.32% at intraday, 74,271 points. Let's see how Egypt performs. Let's go to that index. We see it massively down 2.05% at intraday. However, I'm going to say profit taking is taking its toll here as well. While we saw positive uh, uptick for Kenya's exchange on Monday, it ended 0.12% in the green. Now, that's two positive sessions since Friday. Now, that's very good for that exchange. Now, let's dive into what's happening at the NGX. And we have Mr. Kofi Garba, CEO, APT Securities Limited, to give us what's happening at the NGX, what's driving the negative sentiments, if this is just temporary, or are we going to see it persist for the rest of the week? Good afternoon, Mr. Garba. It's good to have you on the program. Yeah, good afternoon for having me. And Mr. Garba, the market has pulled back now two days. Well, yesterday started negative sentiment, and today we're seeing it negative at intraday. What is happening? What are investors thinking about at, at the exchange? Well, what are they buying? What are they selling? Generally, we're not surprised in view of the performance of the market in the month of January. In most cases, when January become boom and you had the index gain almost about 40% in the month of January, you expect profit taking. And that's what is taking place in the month of February. This is likely going to continue up to the end of the week, except those companies started coming with the corporate action. And don't forget that most of the company have given us 12 months to resolve and audit it. What we are waiting is the corporate action. Among the profit you have declared, how much are you giving to the shareholders as a dividend or as a bonus? Except that corporate action is started releasing, the bank may not likely going to uh, pull back. So it will continue to take the profit, adjust the prices based on the expectation of the corporate action. But by the time the corporate action started releasing, maybe in the middle of the month of February or toward the end of February and early March, we are expecting to see for the second rebounds of the market. Because it's normal when you declare corporate action, people want to benefit from it. So talking about earnings that have you know we've seen some unaudited reports and some audited, but for the banking sector, FBN Holdings, I think released this unaudited report. Can you speak to FBN Holdings report and some of the other reports? Fidelity Bank also brought in their report, and Boa Foods, I mean Boa Cement, and the rest of them have brought in their report. So what can you tell your own take for you know what's your own? Um, how do you digest this report? Can you break it down for us? Is it impressive re well, reports for investors? When you look at the earnings, especially by the financial sector, banking in particular, they have all doubled their earnings. And this is not a surprise to us because most of them, they were house uh, foreign exchange and they have to rate it at the current market value. And therefore, there is foreign exchange gain. However, with the new policy set by the CBN, this may not likely going to continue so banks have nowhere to hide their foreign exchange. They either sell it or meet up the demand. 
And if the new guideline is strictly adhere, banks are not likely going to declare the huge profit they, as they declare for the previous year. However, for the other uh, manufacturing sector, most of them declare losses, especially those who are related with the foreign exchange or those who are related with the imported raw material. However, we are expecting this that is just mitigant and is for a short term. So therefore, we are still expecting that most of the term are likely going to push their cost to the consumer and the consumer have no choice because you have no alternative. And therefore, we are expecting that corporate action, especially in terms of bonuses and the dividend is likely comes from the manufacturing sector, even those that declare losses, they may dip into their reserve and declare some prop, uh, dividend. So we are still have that, that hope, and therefore the expectation of the corporate actually is this. But for the banking sector, you know most of them, they are going to face the recapitalization by the CBN. So we are not envisaging much dividend declared by the bank because they need to preserve their reserve in order to meet the minimum requirement, capital requirement as issued by the CBN. We are waiting for the CBN guideline. Okay. But in view of that, people have started taking profit. If you look at yesterday and today, talk like UBA, GT Core, Access Bank, Fidelity, most of them, they declare losses because people are taking profit. Okay. Don't forget, most of these banks have gained 100% even in this year. Okay, so very quickly, uh, uh, Mr. Garber, before I let you go, could you just speak to Owando? I know that the court has set a date for their hearing. Uh, could you just speak to what uh, investors should expect from that court? Well, for me, the investors should not worry about the court issue because the court on issue of own debt is non-issue. In the first instance, if the minority shareholder decided to take the company for delisting. This is never done in the history of the capital market, where a minority take it. And the majority, that is the own debt itself, ocean and oil, declare it in the last year. They say, in case you insist us to delist, we are going to pay you seven naira. Does it make any sense to go to the market and say delist and take seven naira when the market is willing to give you 14 to 15 naira as it is today? Not only that, I see no reason why even the judge continue holding that case. This is an issue that could have been handled by the Investment Security Tribunal, which is said for this, but they choose not to go there. So the judge could have even struck the case and asked them, go to Investment Security Tribunal to look for what you are looking, not necessarily come to the Federal High Court. In any way, minority shareholder have no case because the majority shareholder have promised to pay them seven naira. And today is trading for 10 naira. So why should you insist to delist to get 7 naira when the market trading at 14 naira? Mm. I can tell you, if all they will release their 2022 result, and 2023 even management account, all they will have doubled the current price where it is. All we ask for the investors to be patient, hold it, you have hold it for long. So holding it for a few months is not much. Okay. But I'm not bothered with the court issue. Okay. Because as far as we are concerned, it's non issue. Mm. That's very true. So, very quickly, in one sentence, can you tell me if the market is going to close in the green or in the red? Will it flip from red to green? Is there any miracle of that happening? It's unlikely the market to, except in one of the two, which I doubt much because we have the MTM, we have the number just red. If they can release their corporate action, that can turn around the market and uh, Airtel. Otherwise, I see the market is likely going to close negative, but not as worst as yesterday. Mm. Because as of today, we are taking 0.2 compared to 1.36 percent lost last uh, yesterday. Mm. So it's likely to close negative, but marginally. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kurfi Garber, CEO APT Securities, for sharing your thoughts on business incorporated. So thank you for having me. So move on to the Middle East now, where trading for major equities were also mostly negative at intraday. Abu Dhabi uh, down 0.92%, that's nearly 1% down. Uh, Dubai also down massively, nearly 2%. Still within the region, we see Saudi and the Qatari indexes trading in opposite directions. We see Saudi down 0.44%, Qatari index up 0.14%. Now in the US, we've seen the futures were lower in early trade on Tuesday. And this is following sell-offs, and that was spurred by higher bonds 
bond yields and still inged on worries that the Federal Reserve may not cut rates as much as Wall Street had expected. And now, futures tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average was down 0.71%. We see S&P futures down 0.32%, and NASDAQ also down 0.2%. Now, during Monday's trading session, we saw all indexes pulling back, and they all retreated from their record highs, Dow especially. But on the economic front, on Tuesday, that's today, Wall Street will be keeping an eye out for the New York Fed's household debt and credit report for the fourth quarter. Now, let's look at Asia and see how the markets there performed. Asia-Pacific markets mostly declined. Japan's Nikkei 225 was down 0.53%. Now, in Japan, household spending dipped more than expected in December, falling 2.5% year-on-year. And this when compared to 2.1% expected by economists. Now, South Korea's KOSPI was also down more than half a percent to 2,576 points. We're seeing China and Hong Kong stocks also surging. Uh, on Tuesday, authorities in the world's largest economy took measures to arrest the recent sell-offs in its equities. Now, Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index, as I mentioned, rose uh, almost 4% in the final hour of trade. Mainland Shanghai stocks also rose 3.2%. 2-3% and the S&P ASX 200, uh, that's in Australia, was down 0.58% from its close. Now we see the Reserve Bank of Australia left the official cash rate unchanged at 4.35% as expected. And this probably having some impact on the trading and sentiments of investors there. So in a, that's probably a wrap from that region. We're hoping to see a bit of rebound because the Asian mm. markets have been down, dipping yeah, down for some down. time now. Yeah, it's been down since the story with Evergrande, the order for it yes, to Yes, the real estate giant there has been pulling back the markets. I think yeah. sentiments has been rippling. As in that ripple effect on other stocks, mm. other markets has been really huge. But hopefully they get a recovery soon. Mm. Thank you so much, Will. Yeah. All right, now let's uh, head to Europe now. And uh, what is the connection between Europe and Africa? Because we hear that the European Union is extending sanctions against Zimbabwe for another year. Uh, let's get the details and a little bit of background on this. Chiponda joins us with a hi, Chiponda. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me, Innie. Well, the EU is extending the sanctions until February 20 next year. Those sanctions include an embargo on arms and equipment, which could be used to repress Zimbabweans. And there's also a targeted asset freeze against Zimbabwe's defence industry. The EU has said it is renewing the sanctions in the country because of the political situation there. Elections in Zimbabwe have not been free and fair, and that's why we see Brussels maintaining sanctions. It plans to monitor Zimbabwe's human rights situation to determine whether to maintain the restrictions. The EU also says it is willing to adapt its policies if there are changes in Zimbabwe. Now, the aim of the sanctions has been to encourage political reform in the country since 2002. And we have seen some changes in terms of restrictions. For instance, last year, the EU removed individuals from its sanctions list, including Grace Mugabe, the widow of former President Robert Mugabe. Now, that move brought an end to sanctions that targeted individuals in the country. So what about the impact? Is it having any impact on the economy? Any, the sanctions have been costly for the Zimbabwean economy. It's important to remember that it's not just the EU that has had sanctions against the country, but also the US. Last year, we heard Zimbabwe's Vice President Constantino Chiwenga say that the country had lost more than $150 billion due to sanctions by the EU and the US. And he also said that the impact went beyond the country and could be felt in all of Southern Africa. Now, the sanctions aren't just about investment in Zimbabwe. They are also about limiting the country's access to capital markets. Now, what we have seen in the last two decades is Zimbabwe becoming extremely isolated. It is no longer one of Africa's breadbaskets. Millions of Zimbabweans have left the country, causing it to suffer a brain drain, especially when it comes to healthcare professionals. The country has struggled for years to revamp its currency, but that hasn't worked. Nearly 80% of transactions are in the U.S. dollar. And often, government workers strike because their pay doesn't cover the, com the country's rampant inflation. Mm. Yeah, we know what's happening to the Zimbabwean dollar now. But what about the markets? What's happening? 
Well, European markets are expected to trade higher today, Inni. Investors have had the opportunity to digest the prospect of higher interest rates for longer. News that Chinese authorities have pledged to boost their investment to stem a market rout in China is also helping market sentiment. And here in Germany, industrial output figures from December are in focus. And of course, there's also a slew of earnings reports due today. Any, those will include UBS, BP, and Linde here in Germany. All right, uh, Chip, thank you so much for that. Talk to you tomorrow. Well, from uh, Zimbabwe, let's head to South Africa, where uh, South Africans expect an increase of between 72 cents to 75 cents per litre in the price of petrol. And that should start tomorrow, Wednesday, with diesel expected to increase by between 70 cents to 73 cents. This is according to a data uh, released by the Central Energy Fund before the official announcement from the department later on uh, this week. Projections for the fuel price in February have steadily deteriorated throughout January, going from no change at the beginning to a significant increase by the end of the month. This is predominantly due to a rise in the price of oil due to the conflicts in the Middle East and rising geopolitical tensions. A correspondent in South Africa put this report together. South Africans will have to dig even deeper into already shallow pockets as the price of fuel is expected to increase significantly in February. While most consumers are recovering from festive season, spending and stretched budgets, the latest fuel price prediction from the Automobile Association, AA, points to a steep hike at the pumps from Wednesday. The AA said with household budgets in the red, this new fuel price increase will come as a double blow. Acting National Spokesperson, Parliamentary Coordinator, Matthew Parks, explains. We've seen the cost of living really rising. Um, inflation has peaked at about 7.8% earlier this year. Electricity has gone up by 18.65%. This year is going to go up by 12% next year. Food inflation, which hits workers the hardest, has really gone out of control. So workers are really struggling. Yet at the same time, you find that government employers continuously blame workers for the economic crisis. They continually seek to impose wage freezes upon workers in the public and the private sector. We think that government really must do more. We appreciate that government cannot do much about the war in Ukraine and the perennial conflicts in the Middle East, which always push up the international oil price. And we're always going to be further exposed as a country because we import oil to these international oil price uh, fluctuations, which then have an impact upon the fuel price. But government can do something about the fuel price tax regime. While the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy is yet to confirm this increase, the AA said that motorists could expect a litre of 95 octane to climb from 22 rands 44 cents to 23 rands 15 cents a litre. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channel Television News. In Zambia, the, company, the country plans to directly buy and sell a portion of the copper produced in the southern African nation, competing with trading giants including Mercuria Energy Group Limited and Glencore PLC. Uh, they want to do it in a way that's fair. They call it fair and commercially suitable for the mining companies. And the president, Hakande Ichenlema, a senior economic advisor, had said that uh, they can come as a commercial player to compete with other commodity traders to make financing available for the mines for them to use as a fair share of their resource. About 24 hours ago, Cobalt Metals, a California-based metals exploration company backed by billionaires including Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, said that it had discovered a vast copper deposit in Zambia. The rare discovery of a large-scale copper deposit could help in the global race to secure a supply of materials critical to the energy transition. Copper is in high demand because it's in use for renewable energy and electric vehicles. We go to Egypt now, where on February the 5th, that was yesterday, Tuesday, Monday, the Central Bank of Egypt was forced to auction dollar-denominated treasury bills worth $1 billion. This move is said to be part of the CBE's ongoing effort 
to stabilize Egypt's teetering economy. The TB auction aims, aims to alleviate the pressure on a country's foreign exchange reserve. Before this latest auction, the CBE had already sold more than one year TB's worth of $850 million. And uh, this is despite these measures, the Egyptian pound continues to face challenges. And now let's head to the crypto space and see what's going on there. Some interesting stories uh, we see. But first of all, let's look at the prices and see what's going on right there in the crypto space. I think one of the interesting stories that caught my attention earlier has to do with former president of the United States, Donald Trump. But let's look at the numbers first, and then uh, we would go to that. Now, we see that the color is mostly green this afternoon, but, um, well, we to see has gained 0.21%, but... It's still 42,971. There was a pullback earlier, but uh, having more red, more greens, I guess, might give us a little bit of comfort. Ethereum is also up 0.27%. BNB, uh, Solana has some news going on around there, but XLP is, however, in the uh, red and all of that. But let's look at uh, the, the greed index, and we see that the market is greedy, in spite of the fact that... Uh, Bitcoin hasn't hit that 45,000 that is expected yet, so we're still driving there. We're not, we're not yet, uh, uh, and all of that. So these are the prices, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Airbnb, Cardano, and then XRP is the only one in the red. So just before we talk about that now, I saw an interesting story I thought to share with you that there have been several Donald Trump-themed tokens on Ethereum, on Solana, and other networks, and spiked as much as 100% in the past 24 hours, as crypto fund mechanism capital uh, said that such tokens were its first positions of 2024. Now, whether this will help uh, former presidents and intending candidates in the upcoming election, I don't know, but mechanism capital has uh, said that uh, accumulated its first new positions of 2024, uh, as well as uh, founder Andrew Kanga said in an expose that these new positions center around Trump and include Trump-related meme coins and NFTs. So let's see if uh, uh, Donald Trump can move the market <laughs> one way or the other, you know. I, I, I guess uh, Laddy Williams will be watching out for this also. We're still in the crypto space. Uh, yesterday, the BC Supreme Court upheld the provincial government's 18-month moratorium on new crypto mining operations connecting to the power grid enacted in December 2022. The pause is meant to allow the province time to study the industry's impact on BC's economic and environmental goals. The ruling comes after Conifex, uh, a forestry company that recently branched into crypto mining, challenged the moratorium in court. I know that a country also in Asia, they're also looking at the impact, I think it's China, of mining and, and regulating it in one way or the other. So um, we see that mining of, of, of cryptocurrency is also getting some attention at this time. But let's go back to the prices and bring in our guests. I think we have Rume. Rume, are you there? Good, afte yeah, good afternoon, Rumen. Good afternoon, Rumen. So good um, tell us about this movement we see. We see the market is greedy, but the price of Bitcoin is not so impressive. You know, help us to understand that balance. Yeah, a lot of people are thinking that uh, when it's just green, oh, it's, a, it's a period where we can all make money, uh, you know, and sometimes they assume that the uptrend is a bull market. And most times, the uptrend is usually not a bull market. You know, even in downtrends, there are, there are even in, even in a bear market, there are uptrends. Uh, I mean to say, so all of this meme coin here and there is also bringing liquidity to the market. But in the long term, sometimes these are just distractions. They are just noise. Uh, not forgetting the fact that there's knowledge of overload in this industry. Everyone just want to make quick money, which I don't subscribe to. In fact, most likely, most times I don't like to talk about them. You know, but uh, in the short term, the market is confused. Uh, short to medium term, the market is confused considering all of the data that are coming from the U.S. Uh, probably we might see some pullback, but pullbacks are opportunity to buy uh, realistically. And um, also, 
an opportunity to also position ourselves for for lifetime uh, gains, you know, go, going forward. Uh, there's something I really want to also talk about that is happening in this market now, uh, so that uh, those that are actually trading such tokens can also be very careful, uh, so that they don't fall uh, victim. Some some uh, privacy tokens are being delisted, going to be delisted on the 20th of uh, February 2024, and uh, if you are trading currencies like uh, Monero, multi chain buy. Uh, you have to be very careful because uh, after the listing, you won't be able to trade again. I think there's a min, there's a minimum uh, time, there's a time frame to for withdrawal of your funds. I think around me, you know, so you need to be very careful. There's been a lot of discussions before now about privacy tokens and their uses by illicit uh, uh, guys, bad guys, uh, to move money and launder money around. And the regulators are saying, don't do this uh, if you you want to do transactions with us, most especially for exchange platforms like Binance and the likes, and they are complying to that. So exchange platforms indigenous in, in Africa should also comply so that uh, they don't aid and abate such uh, platform, uh, such uh, digital assets that can easily be used mm. to launder money. Yeah, but, but uh, rumor, that means that even those who want to dispose of theirs, of this uh, uh, Monero, Monero multi-chain via an Aragon, at this time, obviously, the price is, they're going to be like almost losing trying to dispose it because everybody wants to dispose at this time. Is there a safe haven for anyone who wants to do that? Yeah, so uh, I like this question you just asked now. So uh, in crypto, sometimes you lose, sometimes you win, but a safe haven for all of these things now is best better just to go, go liquidate to Bitcoin or stable coins so that they can hold your liquidity for now rather than just uh, allow it uh, because the, the price is going to plummet more. And it's not good. One of the things that uh, really get people worried in this industry is to see your money go down. So you want to risk that for now. Mm. So help me to understand. Um, we see the market is greedy, the index. And yet it's not such a... Because greed is when you're supposed to make money. So that index, what if there are people who depend on it to make their investments or disposing decisions? Does it mean it cannot truly direct... Yeah, so uh, fair and green index is also is, is a very good signal to do transactions, to robot. Uh, for those of us that are heavily involved in this industry, we're very, very careful with fair and green index. Sometimes when the market tell you uh, certain things, you have to go check the charts, you have to go check the news, you also benchmark also. For example, me, I do a lot of that with the U.S. economy, right? Uh, the, there's a lot of liquidity coming from that part of the world. You know, so now that the market is greedy, uh, it shows that uh, certain assets are actually uh overbought you know so tendency for them to be oversold is going to be high you know so the fact that everyone is greedy now usually i flip to the idea of warren buffett maha that says when they are greedy that's the time you leave the market and when they are scared is when you buy so most times when the market is greedy uh, i usually don't get, i usually don't touch it because uh it's a sign that we might probably see some pullback which might get a lot of people that are following that trend to be greedy as well to lose a lot of money Sounds like we, we shouldn't follow the trend. I mean, just read the map, follow the graphs, and make your own decision. <laughs> exactly. In fact, trading crypto makes you your own psychology. So uh, you don't have to follow the psychology of the crowd because if you do, you're going to lose a lot of money. Okay, so let's end on this note on uh, <clears throat> uh, Nigerians. The, the, I think you were even part of a conversation that said that a stable coins are gaining popularity in Nigeria. How true is that? Yeah, so the, the use of stable coins in Nigeria are gaining popularity. So most especially the use young folks believe in cryptocurrency and stable coins actually hold the value. You know, so countries like us and some other countries in Africa that are battling with inflation. So most people want to save their wealth. And uh they do, they are not looking at the alternative like uh the, the, the dollar bill, uh where we have the uh, BDCs operating, right? They like to use newer technologies like uh, stable coins like CBDM. USD, USDT and USDC circle, you know. So the, the reason why it's gaining popularity because it's easily accessible on the internet. You just go to the, the various exchange platform and buy it. It's even cheaper. Uh, you don't have to handle it physically. So for example, you just have to buy, transfer, hold, use it to buy cryptocurrency. It makes life really seamless with almost zero fees, right? Rather than go to uh, expose yourself buying uh, the dollar bill and it, become, it could Post some security threat. So the world is evolving, and uh, I'm very happy young Nigerians and Africans are also involving building solutions that accept 
uh, stable coins for payment as well. And, I, and I'm also sure that since the regulation has come in Nigeria, where uh, government are saying, come, let's discuss and let's see how we can even regulate better, all of these things are going to gain more traction as we're going forward. Mm. And yet, the BDCs did accuse you guys of being the cause of shortage. Ex ex exactly. Shortage well, of well, FX. Like, I've, been, I've, been <laughs> trying to, I've been trying to marry both, but you know, it's, it's kind of difficult because if you are doing uh, non physical and then you're being accused of causing the shortage of the physical, I, I don't know where that's connected. In, a lot of young Nigerians are using that, and we have the populations. Nigeria has a very huge young population. And when they're doing transactions, some of them are receiving payment uh, in USDT from their remote work. And so there's no point trying to do all of the domiciliary, blah, blah, blah. All right, Ruben, thank you so much for, for that. It take a while for us to understand that. But thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Ine. My pleasure. All right, so uh, that's it. Uh, this, uh, you know, the BDC is accusing the uh, crypto investors but I, I i don't see the connection but anyways that's it that's where we'll draw the curtain for this 55 minutes of business conversations you've had right here on channel television thank you so much for being a part of it you can watch it anytime on our youtube channel that's youtube.com forward slash channels web you have business morning for 10 a.m and you have business incorporated for 1 p.m thank you so much i'm Ini john mekwa enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>